Welcome back students. We are going to start a new lesson today in this video. And this is uh, lesson number four. Moving charges and magnetism. In the first three lessons, we talked about static electricity and also current electricity. In static electricity, we discussed the Coulomb force, electric field, electric potential and capacitors. In current electricity, we discussed the grip velocity, the origin of resistance in conductors and uh, the ways in which you will arrange resistors, series and parallel, cells, their EMFs and their internal resistance and finally we saw a few instruments the Wheatstone bridge, the meter bridge and also the potentiometer. This is the first time that we are going to talk about magnetism. We have not talked about it in any of our previous lessons but this is the, the first time. And uh, as a background we have to talk about uh, a Danish physicist who lived in the 19th century, Hans Christian Ørsted. In about 1820, he observed something in his lab. He sensed that when he was doing experiments with currents, the magnetic compasses in his lab started deflecting if they were nearby. So he realized that there is some connection between current and also magnetism and he researched that further he went deeper into that idea and uh, he came up with some findings and one of them is this if I take a conductor and send current through that conductor and there is a magnetic field which is formed around that conductor the direction of that magnetic field is like concentric circles with the conductor, the current carrying conductor at their center. So if I have a current carrying conductor like this, then I can have concentric circles around this, this conductor. And this is the direction of the magnetic field, field produced by this current. So this was a, was a very important discovery and this was, a, uh, this was going to set the world in a different direction. And people started realizing the relationship between electricity and magnetism after this. And lots and lots of experiments were conducted in this area by Ampere and others and finally Maxwell combined everything and then gave his famous equations which we'll study about a little later but Hans Christian Ørsted's experiment in 1820 was the beginning of our understanding of the relationship between electricity and magnetism And after this, many people, as I said, have worked on it. And uh, as a starting point for this lesson, we are going to, to talk about, to discuss what is called as the Lorentz force. Lorentz gave us an equation based on magnetism and charges. And that is what we will start this lesson with. Okay. Uh, suppose you have a charge uh, in an electric field. How do we calculate the force experienced by the charge? So we have 
the equation which we have already come across in our previous lessons and that is the force experienced by a charge in an electric field E is equal to the charge multiplied by the electric field intensity itself, right? So if we were to assign a direction, then I take this direction and also that would also be the direction of this one, the force. So this is something that we already come across. Suppose you have a charge here, charge Q, and if that is kept in this field E, then this is a force experienced by that charge. Okay. So there is no confusion about it, there is no uh, question what we have about this. Because this is something that we have already come across and then uh, a lot of problems with. Okay. Um, and now the question is what happens when we have a charge in a magnetic field? Okay. So I have the charge here. Now instead of an electric field, I'm going to have a magnetic field B. What is going to happen to this charge? Second question. Lots of experiments were conducted and we found something. That is, the force experienced by this charge in the magnetic field is given by this expression. That is, force experienced by the charge in the magnetic field B is given by this expression. Charge Q and then V is the velocity of the charge and it's going to have a vector cross product with the magnetic field B. So if B is a magnetic field and Q is a charge, then the force experienced by the charge is given by this expression QV cross B. Okay, so QV cross B is the expression you have for the force experienced by a charge in the magnetic field. I want you to, to understand the difference between this and this expression. Note here that the direction of the field is the direction, sorry, the direction of the force is the same as the direction of the external electric field if the charge is positive. If the charge is negative, then you will have minus Q into E. So in that case, the force direction will be opposite to the direction of E. But note here, that is not the case. There are, there are a couple of things that you need to, to understand from this expression. One, if the charge is stationary, then it is not going to experience any force. Right? Because B is zero. Suppose I just have a charge Q and I bring a magnet near it. This charge is not going to do anything because it's not moving. Okay? So V is zero, so F will be zero if the charge is not moving. That's point number one. But that is not true with this. Because even if the charge is stationary, the field will try to move. But here, if the charge is stationary, the magnetic field will do nothing. Okay, so if V is zero, the force will be zero. And secondly, the direction of the force. Notice here, here, the direction of the force is the direction of V if Q is positive. But not so here. You see, it's, you have a, a cross product, a vector cross product. So you have V cross B. So the resulting direction will be perpendicular to both B and V. It's a vector cross product. So the resulting direction will be perpendicular. This is V, and let's say this is B. So V cross B will go in. Okay? Will go in. So this would be the direction of force. Okay, if this is theta. So the resulting force will be perpendicular to both V and B. It's a vector cross product. So I want you to note these two differences. 
between the force experienced by a charge in an electric field and the force experienced by the charge in a magnetic field. In the electric field, whether the charge has a velocity or not, it will experience a force Q into E. But in the magnetic field, if the charge does not have V, it won't experience any force. The charge must be moving in the magnetic field. If it's not moving in the magnetic field, then the charge will not experience any force at all. That's point number one. And second, the direction of the force experienced is perpendicular to both B and B. The force is not in the direction of B, not here. Here, the force could be in the direction of E. But here, the force can never be in the direction of B. Nor can it be in the direction of V. The force will always be perpendicular to both V and V. In it here. Okay? So, so this is what will happen to a charge kept in an electric and magnetic field. So, if a charge is moving like this, let's say this is V, and then there is an E here, okay, and maybe there is a, a V here, something like that, then the charge is going to experience forces due to both E and B. Force due to E, anyway, because it's a charge, and force due to B, because it's a charge and moving. It's a moving charge. So the net force will be the vector sum of the forces experienced due to the electric field and also the magnetic field. Okay? So the force net force experienced F is equal to Q to E plus Q V from V. Okay? So this is what we call as a Lorentz force. Okay? So this expression was given by Lorentz. So we keep using, I mean, we, keep, we, we call this as Lorentz force. Okay. And simply F is the sum of Fe plus Fb, that's all. Fe is given by this expression, Fb is given by this expression. So this is Lorentz force. And if you want to, uh, to simplify it further, then I can have it like this. So F is equal, you take Q out, and then I can have E plus V cross B. That is also another way of writing the Lorentz force. Okay? So, that's all there is to it. So, the point to remember is this. In the presence of a magnetic field, only a moving charge will be affected by it. And that is why the title of this lesson is moving charges and magnetism. Okay? See, uh, if you think about it, it should make sense. Maybe, okay? uh, all of you have uh, come across from your 10th standard that uh, a current produces electricity. Right? A current produces magnetism. So current produces magnetism. Uh, so, the, I mean, that is exactly what Hans Christian Erz had also proved, uh, as we discussed only a few minutes ago. So you see, magnetism will be affected only by magnetism, right? Why? I mean, it should make sense. Think about it. Take the law of gravitation. Mass affected mass, right? And take electricity, Coulomb's law. Charge affected charge, right? So, by the same token, you can say that magnetism affects magnetism. But then, when can 
magnetism being produced. In this case, when current flows through it, when the current flows through a conductor, magnetism can be produced. Okay. So, what is current? Is it just charge? No, it's moving charge. So, when current moves, then it produces a magnetic field around itself. Okay. So, when a charge moves, it produces a magnetic field around itself. And that is going to affect a magnet. Or that is going to be affected by a magnet. Okay. So, only a moving charge can be affected by magnetism, not a static charge. I want you to understand this. I want you to make note of this expression, the Lorentz force. F is equal to QE plus QV cross B. And pay attention to the order in which they appear. V cross B, not B cross B. If you have B cross B, then what happens? Then the direction changes. The direction of force will change. Right? Instead of B cross B, if you put B cross B. So it is always V cross B. Then how do I remember this? Remember this. Q V B. That is Queen Victoria Building. Okay. So Queen Victoria Building. Q V B. So it's always Q V cross B. So if you remember this, you won't forget this. You won't confuse the order in which V and B appear in the expression. So Queen Victoria building should give you Q V cross B. Okay? Hope you understand this. Okay. Uh, now that what happens to a single charge when it is kept in the magnetic field, let us focus on what happens when a certain amount of current is flowing through a conductor. Okay? When the conductor is kept in the magnetic field. So what did we say first? We said the force experienced by a charge due to the field B is equal to Q V cross B. Okay, so this is what we said. It's for a single charge. So you have V here and then charge could be moving this way. Q charge could be moving this way. So then V cross B would be the force experienced by this charge in the presence of the magnetic field B. Okay. Now the question is what happens when the current is flowing through a conductor? Okay. Oh, well, the current is simply a collection of charges. And if I'm going to keep the current carrying conductor in a magnetic field, so this is a current carrying conductor, let's say. So I is the current which is flowing through the conductor. If we keep the current carrying conductor in the magnetic field, let's say the magnetic field is going into the board. Okay? So this is the magnetic field. Okay? Everywhere, the magnetic field is there. Right? Okay. Which means that I kept a magnet like this. So there is a field. It's going into the board. Like that. The field is there everywhere. B. Okay? It's all B. I'm keeping this there. Let's say the, the, the conductor is of length L. So what is going to be the force experienced by this conductor because I've kept it in a magnetic field. Okay? Uh, well, it shouldn't surprise you that you would experience a force. It would experience a force. Right? Because your charge is moving inside the conductor. So each charge would experience a force because of the magnetic field and because the charges are moving. So the charges would experience a force. And the total force on the conductor would be the sum of the forces experienced by these individual charges which are moving in the conductor. So if you take a current carrying conductor and keep it in a magnetic field, it's going to experience a force. Okay? Up or down. Okay. Uh, 
what would be that force is a question. Okay, so what we know? We know only this, right? We we'll start with this. So what is the force experienced by this? Well, the force experienced by this is going to be equal to u v cross v. Okay? Q would be the total charge inside the conductor. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, let me assume that positive charges are moving in this direction. Actually, it is not so. Negative charges are moving in the opposite direction. Only the electrons are moving in the opposite direction. But we say that the current is moving in this direction, right? So, uh, for the sake of argument, let us say that the positive charges are moving this way. But they are not. We need to remember that they are not moving that way. Only electrons are moving in the opposite direction. But that is equal to positive charges moving in this direction. Okay? Uh, so the positive charges are moving in that direction. So each will experience a force, right? Each of them will experience a force. Now which direction would it experience? Let us say, I said I is this, the current direction is this, so the positive charges must be moving in this direction. Right? Okay. So let me take a charge Q, when this uh, E, you know, maybe a positive electron. We have a different name for it, but uh, let me just say that there is this positive charge with E is moving in this direction. Okay, so what is it? The field, uh, the force experienced by that? Well, E is the value of the charge. And let us say it is moving with the drift velocity of V D, because current means there is a drift velocity of these charges, right? So moving with the drift velocity of V D, and there is V in this direction. So what will happen now? So it's going to be charge E, charge E, and V is a drift velocity cross B. B is the field. As I said, this is going inside the into the board. That's the direction of V, right? So I say N or rather E E V into E V into B. So E cross B. So, so V is this way, B is this way, V cross B will give me this direction, upward direction. So this individual uh, charges will experience an upward force. So all these will experience an upward force. So you see, you can expect a con the conductor to go up. Okay, its sum of all the forces would be equal to the sum of uh, will be equal to the net force acting on the conductor. Okay, so that is so that's how we do it. Individual charge, if you take so E, I said E, and then B, D, and then cross B. So that is the force acting on each and every. Charge. Okay, uh, so this is what is going to happen. Okay. Now, let's say uh, how many such charges are there? Well, how many such charges you can have in this? Well, if you take n, n is a number of charges per unit length, per unit volume, sorry, per unit volume of this conductor. So the total number of charges n, total number of charges is going to be equal to n into this cross sectional area A of the conductor into the length of the conductor. So that would be that would be total charge. And each charge will experience this force. Okay? Each charge will experience this force. 
This is the force on each charge. Right? So uh, the number of charges, uh, number of charges in this conductor is going to be equal to n, which is for this particular material, the number of free electrons. Okay. Uh, uh, per unit volume, it's multiplied by the cross sectional area of this kind of thing here, right? In the cross sectional area here, the current is going to flow through that. A to that L, that's the volume, like a cylinder. Okay, so that will give you the total number of electrons. Okay? And each of them will experience a force. But in this case, we are not treating them as electrons, but then as a positive charge is moving in this direction, like in the direction of Correct. But actually what's happening? Electrons are moving in this direction. Okay. So they'll have negative V in this direction. So they have negative charge. So negative V and negative charge will result in positive E V. Okay. So that's why we've taken it like that. We are assuming that the positive charges will flow in this direction. Okay? Uh, it's equivalent. Positive charges are not flowing, only negative charges are moving in this direction. But the, the equivalent of negative charges moving in this, in this direction is equal to positive charges moving in the opposite direction, in the direction of the current. And that is what we are considering here. So the total number of charges in this is NE, NA. And each charge will experience this force. Then, so what is the total force? So the total force experienced by them is going to be good. I call this as this Q. It's better, right? Capital Q. So that the capital Q is equal to number of charges into the charge on each of the charge. So that is N into E. That's the total number of charges. That is Q. And then V is VD and cross V. Okay? So now, what is an N? N is equal to N A L and then E V D cross V. Hmm. Well, that should tell you something. It should Bring a bell. Why? Notice here, you've got V here, E there, then N there, and then A here. So V, E, N, A, Veno. And that is equal to the current I flowing through the conductor. We said in the third lesson on current electricity that I in the conductor is equal to Vena, V E N A. Okay? So a drift velocity multiplied by E, the electronic charge, and then N, which is the number of electrons per unit volume of the conductor, and A is a cross-sectional area of the conductor. So this these things, V, E, and A together will be equal to I. Okay? So that is equal to I. I L. Now the question is, V is a vector, I is not a vector quantity. But I need a vector here. Which one can I make as a vector? Well, I'll make L as a vector. Okay? This direction, uh, the, uh, the, the length L of the conductor can be made as a vector. And which direction is it going to have? Well, it's going to have the direction of the current, right? Because that is the direction of the drift velocity you know, for positive charges, right? So I'm going to make L as a vector. The direction of the vector is in the direction of the current. So effectively, what I have is this expression F is equal to I L cross B. Okay. So this is the force experienced by 
a current carrying conductor of length L. I have I current flowing through the conductor of length L, which is kept in an external magnetic field of B, then the conductor will experience a, a force. And that force is given by this expression F is equal to I L cross B. And the resulting force will be perpendicular to both the current I and the field B. Okay? It will be perpendicular to both of them. It's a vector cross product. Keep a note of this expression and I hope you understand how we arrived at it. It's a very important formula. Okay, now uh, let's do a couple of example problems. Let me take example 4.1 first. Example 4.1 A straight wire of mass 200 grams and length 1.5 meter carries a current of 2 amperes. It is suspended in mid-air by a uniform horizontal magnetic field B. What is the magnitude of the magnetic field? Okay. So, it's, a, it's actually a simple problem. Let me try to explain the problem first. And then you will know. uh, Example 4.1. There is a straight wire of mass 200 grams. Okay, it's a straight wire. And the mass of this wire is 200 grams. Or 0 0.2 kg. And uh, length is 1.5 meters. Okay, fine. So this length of the wire is 1.5 meters. And it carries a current of 2 amperes. So the current through this is 2 amperes. I mean, you might ask the question, how can a standalone conductor carry a current you know, of 2 amperes? Well, you need to assume that there is, a, uh, there is some kind of a circuit there, maybe. Maybe you have a battery here. A battery here. Okay, I'm going in this way. And there's a wire stretching it like this. Okay, stretching it like this. And not, you know, it's not properly connected. This wire, the two wires are just touching it. Let's imagine. And if I, I know, like if, if uh, they're not firmly connected uh, to the ends of the of, of this conductor. So you know, left itself, if it, there is no current flowing through it, and it will just drop. It will just fall. Okay. So it's like this. It just fall, okay? Uh, it's just touching. These wires are just touching. So the current is. Let's imagine that the current is, is being supplied to it through uh, an arrangement like this. But that is not talked about in the problem. All the problem says is that two ampere current is flowing through this conductor. Um, well, how can just two ampere current flow through a conductor without anything else? That is not possible. So we are assuming that something like this is happening. But then. The focus is on just this conductor. There is suppose that somehow current 2 amperes is flowing through that conductor. Okay? And one of the ways of sending the 2 ampere through the conductor would be an arrangement like this. There are many other ways of doing it, but let's just stick to it. Okay? Because the focus is only on this conductor, not on anything else. Okay. Now, this is kept in the magnetic field. Okay? Uh, the magnetic field of magnetic field B. Well, okay. Uh, so, what is what is the what is the purpose of this? This is suspended in mid-air. This is suspended in mid-air. This conductor is suspended in mid-air, meaning that it is there. It is not falling down. 
So what, what, what does it tell you? It means that the net force on this conductor is zero. That is why it is not falling, it is suspended there. Well, you know that gravity is acting on it. Anyway, like you have 200 gram mass here. So gravity must be acting on it. So what would be that force? The force of gravity, force of gravity, and this is equal to m into g, so that is 0.2 into the approximately 10 meter per second squared, 9.8 meter per second squared. And let me just take it as 10. Okay, so that gives me approximately, this approximately 2 newton. So right now 2, two newton force is acting on this conductor. So it must be falling down. But it's not falling down. And why? Because there must be another force acting in the upward direction. Okay. Um, then, what is that force? That's the question. Well, there is current flowing to it. Then what can cause a force to act on it? An external magnetic field. They've said that. Okay. There is, a mag there is an external magnetic field. And uh, there is a current flowing through this conductor. So I can expect a force to act on this conductor and that conductor is suspended. Meaning that the force of the magnetic field on the conductor must be upwards because gravity already acting down and it is suspended which means that the force of gravity must be balanced by this magnetic field, by the magnetic force, right? magnetic force due to the magnetic field. Okay, so, so we know that this force, this force, force due to the magnetic field must be upwards. Okay, good. Then what should be the, mag the magnitude of the force? The magnitude of the force due to the magnetic field must be equal to Fg. Only then it will be suspended. Only then the net force on the conductor will be zero. So it won't move, it won't have any acceleration. So this must be equal to 2 Newton. Whereas Fg is 2 Newton, so Fp must also be equal to 2 Newton. Okay? And then, what do you know? Fb, you know, equal to I L cross V. Okay? Fine. So that would be I L B sine theta. So the force is equal to I L B sine theta. So L is in this direction. So Okay, because I is in the direction. I have chosen the direction. I mean, if I have chosen I to be in this direction, well, that's a different story. But now I have chosen uh, I to be in that direction. I will say like L will also be in that direction. Okay? And L cross B must give me an upward force. So, which way should B be? That's the question. Okay? And let us assume that this B is 90 degrees to the uh, to the conductor, perpendicular to the conductor, flow of current. Okay. So let's say that this 90, this is theta is 90, that theta must be 90 degrees, okay. and that results in I L D simply. Okay. So let us assume that the B, the B is going into the board. Current is like this. Okay. B may be into or out of the board. We don't know. Okay. Um, but it is 90 degrees to the current. That's all we are saying. Okay. So if that is the case, then what should be the direction of B? Well, I is in this direction, so I L is in this direction. I need a force up, so my B must be into the board. Why? Because I L cross B 
must give me a coefficient. Suppose B was outside, then I L cross B would have given me a downward force. So I am not going for that. I have to go for a B which will result in an upward force. So my B should be into the board. So I say that this B must be into the board. Okay. Well, if I chosen the current to be in the opposite direction, then it's different. If I chosen current in this direction, then this is I, this is I L, then B must be out. I L cross B would give me the upward direction. But I've chosen I to be in this direction. So for this direction, the current is in this direction, then B must be into the board so that I L cross B should give me an upward direction. Because the force due to the magnetic field must balance the gravitational force. Only then the conductor will be suspended in mid-air. So I've got the direction now. Now I just need to find the magnitude of this B. Okay? So F B is two neutrons. So come to F equal to I L B F is 2 newtons then I is 2 amperes and then L is 1.5 meters and then B okay. and this will be gone so B must be equal to 1 by 1.5 or 2 by 3 Tesla the Tesla needs a unit for the magnetic field. So this is B is 2 by 3 Tesla or 0 0.66 Tesla. So to summarize this problem, if I have a conductor which weighs 200 grams and carries 2 ampere current and if I don't want it to fall down but be suspended in midair, then I must be sending magnetic field perpendicular to this conductor into the board with the magnitude of 2 by 3 Tesla. If I do that, then the magnetic force acting on the conductor, the current carrying conductor, will balance the gravitational force. So in that case, the net force on the conductor will be zero and the conductor will be suspended in mid-air. Hope it's clear to you. Okay, let's do example 4.2. And uh, there is a picture, figure 4.4 there, and then it says this. If the magnetic field is parallel to the positive y axis, and the charged particle is moving along the positive x axis, <coughs> as given in figure 4.4, which way? Would the Lorentz force be for an electron and for a proton? Okay. So let me first draw the picture. Uh, let's say this is this is this is the positive x-axis. Okay. And then they are given this as the positive z-axis. Usually you get y there, but then they have given z there, okay. Um, see, uh, then how do you find the positive y axis? That's a question. It's slightly different notice. x, not y, but z is what is given. How do you find the positive y axis? Well, when it comes to the Cartesian coordinate system, we will be using a right hand coordinate system. Meaning, you will be using the vector notation of, you know, like the A cross B thing here, you know, see? But then you will be using right hand for that, okay? Right hand coordinate system. It's like this. If it is X, okay, suppose this is X and this is Y. Then, you see, X cross Y, see, positive Z will be in this direction. That's what you are probably put 
you know, z here, right? If this was y, if this was y, if x, y, then you would have said this is my z. That's what you would have said before. But that's not the case here. What is given here? If it's not y, you've chosen this to be z. Then, which one would be your y? That's the question. You see this? x cross y will give you z. And then, y cross z will give you x. And then, z cross x will give you y. Like this. I cross j will give you k. And then, j cross k will give you i. And then, k, uh, k cross i will give you j. That's from the, from vector j. It's the same thing that you're going to use here. So in this case, z is k, i is that k cross i will give you j. Notice here, positive j is in this direction. So the j, the y axis, positive y axis will be like that. Okay. And this will be your negative y axis. Okay. So you note here, x cross y will give you z. Perfect, right? x cross y will give you z. Everything will work out fine. So this is your positive y direction. Okay, well, if you understand this, then let's go do the problem. So this is example 4.2. Example 4.2. The magnetic field is parallel to the positive y axis as given like this. Okay. It's like this. The magnetic field is like this. So they're given. Okay. So it's like this, if this is x, if this is z, then y is there, into the board. Okay. So then magnetic field is into the board. So it's parallel to the y axis. Okay. Now, this is b. Now the question is, what would be the Lorentz force if an electron or a proton travels in the positive x axis? Okay. This is the direction of travel. So, a proton or an electron is traveling in this direction with this beam. Okay. <coughs> Along the positive x-axis. So, what would be the force? That's the question. Then first ask electron. A is electron. And then B is proton. Okay. First let me do proton. And then I can come to electron. <coughs> so what's the force experienced by proton? B proton. Proton is along the x-axis. Okay? And B is in this direction, into the board. <coughs> so F must be equal to Q V cross B. Right? Okay, now. E, Q is simply E, positive V, that's the charge on the proton. V is this direction and B is into the board. So V cross B up. Okay? So E, B, B, that's the magnitude. What's the direction? Up. Positive K. Positive Z, right? So that is actually. So, the force for the proton will experience a force up. So that is what is captured here. And what will happen to the electron? Well, again, here also, this is proton. Force on the electron is equal to same QV cross B. But now, what is Q? That is minus E. Yeah, negative charge. And then V cross B. Okay. V 
cross B is still up, right? V, because electron is moving in this direction, B is in this direction, so V cross B is still up. V cross B is still up. But then when I multiply that with minus E, then the direction changes, right? It's, it's no longer plus V cross B. It is minus V cross B for electron. Great. So then this gives you E B B. What happens now? It's going to be minus K. Okay? So it is in the opposite direction. So this electron will experience a force down. Proton experience a force up, electron experience a force down. Okay. So e, V, B. So V, B is going to give you only K, but then minus E, so that will become, I can write it like this, right? It's going to be E, V, B minus K. So it's a normal direction. I can write it like that. Okay. Same magnitude, but the directions will be different for both proton and electron. So this is how you do this problem. Hope this is clear to you. And if you have any questions, let me know. And I'll try to explain this again.